Today's podcast is sponsored by Fire Facilities Incorporated, expert engineers, designers, and manufacturers of steel training towers, burn rooms, and mobile units that are all made in the USA. Welcome back to Three Point Firefighter. Today, my guest is Andy Starnes. Now, Andy is a lifelong student of the fire service, and he's been involved with the fire service as a volunteer since 1992 and a career firefighter since 1998. He is, he is a fire service website contributor on the topics of thermal imaging, fire behavior, leadership, behavioral health, and faith-based devotions. He is also the founder of Bringing Back Brotherhood, a nonprofit organization designed to encourage and provide guidance for firefighters in the area of behavioral health counseling, and more. Brother Andy Starnes, thank you for your time. Thank you for being on the show. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate your time. I know you're a busy guy, too. Well, I'm normally not busy. My wife makes me busy. If it was up to me, I would just sit down in this little office and that'd be it. But <laughs> I doubt any firefighter is going to sit still. <laughs> not, not unless they go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So I wanted to, So the, when I first heard of Mr. Starnes, <clears throat> it was a few years ago. And I work, I'm an instructor with the ISFSI mm -hmm. and I was paired with, uh, um, I think a mutual friend, uh, Tony Carroll, do you know, mm -hmm. Tony? Very so well. we were, we were paired together to work on, um, thermal imaging. He goes, I got somebody that does this. <laughs> and so that's how I came to know you. One second. And uh, so he sent me all these insight videos. Mm -hmm. And I was like a kid the first time Star Wars came out. I was watching him, rewatching him. I was making notes. And a, l a lot of that was just because of the material and how it was presented and developed. And it was amazing. Opened my eyes. I'm an instructor, and I thought I knew thermal imaging. I knew such a small percent of what's out there. It was so humbling. Um, and so that was my uh, how I got to know who Andrew Starnes is. Then I found a video uh, it was about a three minute video about it's called advice from for firefighters. And it was seemed so off the cuff. It was just like you speaking the truth about the passion for the job, uh, the tactics, but just overall taking care of your own mental health, too. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Oh, I thought I was over this. I apologize. I keep keep coughing. All right, buddy. I got to cut up a hot tea next to me to keep me from doing this. Oh. So tell me about that, that video real quick. What was it? Uh, what was the background of the context of that video? We were at Bridgeport, Virginia, where well, West, West Virginia, excuse me, doing a Bridgeport Fire Expo sponsored by Interstate Rescue. And there was a film crew there that uh, works for, I guess, Supervac that does all like, you know, the fans and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. Dana Schaefer had them there and they were, they were videoing us doing our class. So we did a, a size up class while the performance under pressure cadre were doing um, a search class and uh, Basil Ibrahim was there. Uh, so Baz, you know, everybody knows him. He was awesome. And we had both parties had finished our class and we were hanging out and the performance under pressure cadre and, and Baz had asked them, went around and just said, you know, you know, what, what, what do you think about the class? What is your opinions about different things? And he will start circling around and ask the instructors to, if anybody had any final thoughts. And I didn't even know they were filming. And I, you know, I just sit there and listen and try to soak up stuff. And he got to me and I had noticed there was a lot of young people there. And when I say young, I'm 47. So I feel, I feel 77, but I'm 47. <laughs> uh, so, but, you know, I still act like I'm 22 in some cases, but that's when I got hired career wise. But when I started talking to them, I just started watching them. And uh, I'm big on watching people's facial expressions, you know, where they look away, are they engaging, are they locking in? And I noticed that they were all kind of in the same position. They were in departments that didn't have a lot of funding. They were young. They were there on their own dime. Uh, nobody paid them to be there. Uh, they, a lot of them wearing, you know, their, their plain street clothes, plus their, their department gear. Uh, they're spending their own money to do all this. And I just, I wanted them not to lose that because I've spent more time battling my own demons and negativity and letting people rent beachfront property in my head, if you will, mm -hmm. and let them take away from me what I, I mean, I, I got in this chasing my dad around. I was a kid. My dad would come home full-time job, get in the car and go to the volunteer fire station. 
I'd go over there and start waiting tables when I was eight years old for fish fries and barbecues for fundraisers. And, you know, that was how I hung out with him. And I saw people giving up their time for free to serve their community. And it just stuck with me. And plus, you know, truth being told, I thought I was going to be a fighter pilot. And I took the mm-hmm. SAT and got a 700 on it. And I went, well, you know, firefighter ain't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> pilot, you know, what? Well, so, but, but I just, I felt compelled to talk to them about where they are and where they're going. And I didn't want them to be, I was naive. I don't know about you, Jake, but I was naive about leadership. I was naive, naive about company officer positions, the stress you face, not the physical stress, but just the junk you're going to run into and then the cumulative stress of things. And, you know, and when I told them, you know, about their home life, I meant it because what's that uh, hair club for men thing? I'm not just the president. I'm a client. You know, yeah. uh, I, I have struggled with that a lot. And that's how I got into it. And I just, I didn't even know they were filming. I just went around and wanted them to know kind of a comprehensive, you know, three minute feel, if you will, this is what your life is going to be like. Good, bad, ugly. And you know what no one talks about, about that speech, Jake? Hmm. There was a young man in that crowd who committed suicide. Oh. That breaks my heart. And I, everywhere I go, I always talk about behavioral health. And you just hope that somebody's listening. It it chokes me up thinking about it. Nobody knows why, what happened, or anything like that. But he's not here anymore. And I tell people, the greatest rescue you may ever make be the one sitting next to you at the kitchen table or on the tailboard may not be a grab down the hallway, but that's the number one killer of us is ourselves. So that's why I did that is I want people to know, I don't want you to be surprised by what the the fires of your life that you face, but you need to know it's not going to be an easy road. You're not going to be, you know, standing up on FDIC stage every day. You're not going to be getting awards every day. You're going to deal with garbage. You're going to face struggles. You're going to have struggles in your marriage. You're going to struggle financially. You're going to be way too busy and miss kids' ball games and birthdays because of shift work. And nobody talks about that. I call it the other side of leadership and I want to know, but in the end, if they'll keep their head, you know, right and plant themselves in right soil and keep good people around them, they're going to grow. But if they stay in the dark, and they get bad people around them and they don't get good influences, you know, it can take them out. And I always like to say brotherhood's not dead. It just might be geographically challenged. You need, you need a group of people. And I have one, I have a fire ground or I call it firehouse kitchen table. And then I've got a uncommon fireman's group and uh, another Christian men's group all on my phone. It's like mm-hmm. school girls are texting each day, you know, <laughs> but it keeps between that my counselor, my wife and my daughter, it keeps me, between the lines it keeps me from you know you get that down and out i want to quit i ain't gonna deal with this garbage no more but you know that's that's the devil talking that ain't that ain't you and i i don't want young people who are fired up about this to get beat down so quick and lose their passion and become bitter and cynical that's that was the whole purpose of that little three minute talk was i don't want them to have waste the time that i wasted being negative being bitter you know, it's a waste. If you think about it, every moment we have, brother, is a is a moment that we can do something with. And I have spent more moments, you know, pondering or reflecting on bad stuff when I could have been doing something positive with it. So that's the summation of that. Uh, you, you're you're so right. When I got in the fire service, about the same time you did, there was zero. Not only was there no real behavioral mental health. Uh, part of any fire training or any fire department, but it was almost frowned upon if you showed any weakness. And I talk about, there's a, it, for me, when people ask me like, oh, what's the worst run and all that, if I describe the worst run to somebody, they would go, what are you talking, there's nothing, that's not bad, what are you talking about? And, but it's it, it still, it, to this day, it, it rings in your brain. And when I try to talk to guys at the firehouse about it, they're kind of like, you know, pushing me away. They were very uncomfortable. Whenever you try to get, you know, somebody in the room and go, hey, listen, that run, it kind of, now right now it's not that bad. If you're in today's fire service, I think if somebody said, hey, man, you want to talk about that run? It's not so bad. Back in the 90s, it was like, man, it's a, you, you knew the job when you signed up for it. And that's not the worst thing you're going to see. There's going to be a lot more. You better suck it up. It was just a total different fire service. And 
<clears throat> I try to keep that in mind and talk to my younger guys, especially when something seem when they seem off, not just the run. It's easy to see that a run is going to maybe set somebody off because it's a horrible car wreck, horrible fire. But like I said, for me, it wasn't those runs. It was the simplest benign run ever that affected me. So I look for the people showing a problem as opposed to just assuming there's one because of the run. Good Does that make you. sense? Well, it's good for you because I think too many people think, oh, it's all the bad calls you see that cause issues. In reality, those are just triggers. I mean, it could be, be something, Jake, you've seen 10 or 12 times before, but you add up a bad couple of years and COVID and financial stress and marital issues and a family member passing away, and then you have one of them calls. That's the straw that breaks the camel's back. And you're like, well, why did that call do that to me? That call didn't do that to you. That was the, that was basically the chink in your armor that you didn't realize you had. And for me, I, I, I can definitely relate to what you're saying because I've had a lot of bad calls, things, horrific things. But when I started having trouble, it wasn't one particular call I could just point out. It was the cumulative effects of things. Mm-hmm. And and me not being ready for certain things, I thought I was ready. Uh, to quote a friend of mine, he's got a great Mayday class. It's called, I Just Wasn't Ready. And I, I think most of us think we are ready and we're not. And we never can be truly ready for the stressors we face. We can, we can train and prepare for them. But I think that culture, that mindset of don't talk about it, you know, you're weak or just suck it up, that's over. <laughs> Uh, yep. if, if you're in that right now, I'm sorry. We, we can get you help and get you support. But people who believe that are in for a rude awakening. As my father says, there's two types of people in this world. One who's humble and one who's about to be. <laughs> the people who say, well, there is no PTSD. There is no depression. There is no anxiety. I'm praying for you right now in my head because I hope you don't experience what most of us have experienced to learn that that is a reality. Because this guy, me used to pick on people who couldn't control their breathing and hyperventilate. And 2010, guess what I experienced? Panic attacks, anxiety, and depression. And it broke me. I mean, no, no warning. I would be home. I could be sitting at a table. I could be driving. I could be in church. It didn't matter. And it would feel like you came up behind me and sat three people on my back and wrapped around my chest and started crushing me. And I couldn't breathe. I thought I was going to die. And I could not control it. And that was a humbling experience for me. And I can tell you that from that point forward, when I saw somebody having a panic attack, I responded, I responded with compassion and empathy, not suck it up. Yeah. And that's, we call this the statement I'd like for you to consider. Mike Guerin says it best. We're members of a club. Nobody wants to be members of number one. And Mm. we call it, we're the broken, we're the crushed, but we're the qualified. Why? Because we've been through it. And that, and we can do something with it or we can ignore it and never talk about it. And I don't think, Jake, that any of us, you or anybody else, goes through something bad for no reason. I don't believe in that at all. There's always something that can be done with that. And I, I absolutely I believe it. Absolutely. For me, the uh, I still have these little they're, – they're sort of panic attacks. I don't know how to describe them, but and they sound silly when I describe them, but they're, they're terrible at the time. I go through these moments where for no reason, kind of like what you're talking about, doesn't matter who I'm around or what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I have this, my heart rate shoots up and I ha- I just feel like I need to run away from where I'm at. And I could be mm-hmm. sitting down having a nice dinner, but my brain and my heart are like, you got to go. You got to start running and don't stop. Get away from here. And it was, it's the weirdest feeling. And then usually <clears throat> there's something that's happened before mm-hmm. that's triggered something that when I can calm down and think about it. It's like, oh, we were in the restaurant and I saw this older lady that, you know, I made a run on somebody looked just like it, blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah. So it's, it's, it's a, uh, you carry a lot of ghosts around. Yeah. And it, it could be any of that. It could be, could be the cumulative stress you've had plus, plus that it could, you know, I'm not a doctor or clinician or psychiatrist or psychologist, but I am, I am somebody who struggled with the same thing you're talking about. And I can tell you that I could narrow down certain things that would trigger mine. You'd take me to Walmart with crowds everywhere. Mm hmm. I would, man, I'd lock up. I'd start watching people I'm like, what's this crazy guy going to do? I'd start getting tense. My blood pressure go up. I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. I felt like in claustrophobic. I've seen guys who, uh, you know, 20 years on a job, never had a problem. We do our annual SCBA training where they got to do all this confident stuff, crawl through the maze. 
they put their mask on and after five minutes they're having a panic attack rip they rip their face piece off and that to quote a good friend of mine rick george there's something there and he he says it best you have to go back to when life didn't suck and remember that and then we start there in that healing process and mm-hmm. that's what if you go see a counselor they'll talk to you about that and i tell you the most humbling thing about counseling is they make you fix your own problem. And when you leave, you're mad at yourself because they ask you questions, you answered it, and you're like, I knew the answer to my own problem. I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> it's, it's, it, and you learn it in marriage, too. It's active listening, clarifying questions, not not listening to basically say, when they stop talking, I'm going to provide the answer. No. Yeah. They, that, that was really eye-opening for me is to see how the brain works and how my body works. And when I think I'm managing something and like you described, and all of a sudden my body starts doing these things on its own and I can't control it. I mean, think about what we do. We respond to people in emergencies and we, we stay calm and they panic. And now me and you are sitting here in relative ease where for no reason whatsoever, you could have been eating dinner and now I'm having a panic attack. Why? That's why most guys and gals don't want to talk about it because they feel weak and vulnerable and, and, and that's okay. As, as so many people I've heard before say, it's okay not to be okay. You're a human being. We see more junk than anybody else and that's not normal, and we expect ourselves to be normal. Right. You can't dip your hand in poison every day and not have effects from it. And uh, the book on resiliency I read, it said, to expose yourself constantly to trauma and think it won't affect you is like to swim in water and think you're not going to get wet. <laughs> it's gonna happen, you know. Yep. So I I wonder how many people would would take this job if on day one they knew everything that could be waiting for them, not just the mental stuff, but you know, cancer, heart attack, uh, you know, family. You could lose, you know, lose your wife and your family. I mean, if you if you stack it up all on paper, there's no reason. I mean, none of us are millionaires either. No. <clears throat> there's no reason for somebody to take this job except. A love and passion for the job. And I always wondered about that because whenever I do new recruits, you know, back in my brain, I'm kind of thinking that I'm like, okay, well, blah, blah, you can go down the list. But, and those are all sort of tangible things. But what's not a tangible thing is, is caring about other people and the fire service and all that. It's, it's such a small little ball, but it totally outweighs everything else negative in the fire service, in my opinion. I agree. I asked uh, one of my neighbors a really powerful question one day. He was go through, you know, you sit there and you talk about everything you go through. And they did the whole blame the world, blame God, blame this, that, and the other. And he's on the fast forward a couple of years later, he's on the other side of it. And I'm sitting there on my back deck. And I asked him, I said, if you could go back to when your child was born and there was no problems and your kid was perfect, there in your arms and God would show you what the next 16 years is going to be like. Would you do it over? Would you stop and not have the child? And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, all that hell you went through. Would you do anything? Would you want us not do it? He goes, no, I would, I would redo it, but I would be there. I'm like, so you're saying you'd be there. For your kid, all the stuff you went through, you still be there. Yeah. So you're not changing your circumstances. You're just changing your attitude. Because I think a lot of us think, like you said, if I could if I could tell, well, you know, here's your 30-year career and here's all the horrible things you're going to see. Here's the marital stress and discord and divorce rate. And here's everything you're going to face. You still want to do it. I think they need to have that information. You and I, we don't work for Psychic Friends Network. But we, <laughs> there's enough data for us to say you're going to have like 70 something percent of us are going to seek counseling. You know, 50 to 70 percent of us may get divorced. We have the highest anxiety and depression rate. We have a higher risk of suicide. It's not as high as the news makes it, but we have higher risk of everything. I think we're overachievers at all the bad stuff. But that should be brought to their attention in the beginning and give them skills and say, look, you're going to learn how to size up a working fire and instantly in your mind process and develop a plan on a building you've probably never been in before with people you may not have ever worked with and you're going to come together in this amazing cohesive team and you're going to mitigate a situation under the most challenging circumstances ever seen before in your life 
Isn't that awesome? They're like, yeah. But then you're going to go home and you're going to have the most difficult things thrown at you and you're going to fall apart. Now, why is that? You're telling me that me and you could sit down with the, all the training you've had in teaching, Jake, and, and we could teach people to get out of any situations from writ to maydays and attacking basement fires and all this stuff. But when we face, like what my one of my friends is facing right now, a very difficult situation with his son, we're going to fall apart. And I think we need to take a look at those skills and say, why aren't we teaching the young firefighters, the soon-to-be dads and moms, how to manage the fires of their life, too. Because you know as well as I do, if they come to work and they're like the Kyle Romaguses, the awesome guys you want in your truck, right? And they got stuff going on at home, they're not on their A game. They're not. I know I wasn't. So how are we going to help them not just be better at forcing doors, but how am I going to teach them to force down that door and look their kid in the eye and go, I'm putting you in a group home. I mean, that's, that's tough. You know, how are you going when you force down that door and, and tell your spouse, I'm, I'm going to get alcohol treatment, you know, all the stuff that nobody wants to talk about. We need to talk about it and we need to be open about it and we don't need to beat each other up about it. I'm tired of that. I'm tired of people tearing each other apart on social media, keyboard commander, whatever. I mean, if we're going to sacrifice our life for a guy down the street or a gal down the street that we may not even met or may not even like, but you wouldn't pee on the guy from A-Shift if he was on fire, I mean, that's a problem. <laughs> we need to fix that. Yeah. You know, we we are the most dysfunctional, functional group in history, I believe. Oh, yeah, so I, absolutely. I, my little sermon, I think we need we need some street psychology, if you will. <laughs> so. Well, yeah, I've always said that firefighters are the first person to step up and help somebody, but they're the last person to step back and help themselves. Oh, we're, they, you're dead on. We hate it. Preach. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. But again, if so, I mean, this is going to lead into another question here. But so we're obviously getting better in the fire service with with uh, having behavioral mental problems, be it addiction, whatever it is, uh, depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts. But it feels like to me we're just playing catch up. We're not ahead of the the, the curve yet. Uh, but with your bringing your your bringing back brotherhood, what all this led to that? I assume. Yes, sir. It led. It started with me having issues and my wife calling me out because I dealt with it my way for three years. And I was bringing it home and taking it out on them, and she politely informed me that. Uh, this is not the greatest job in the world because I wasn't acting like it and that a one-year-old didn't need to be screamed at. And my attitude had changed. She also politely informed me that I was two different people, that I was acting like somebody not so nice at work and trying to be a good godly man at home. And she was betting the not so nice guy at work was going to win out. Uh, So with all 10 toes broken, realizing I'm a hypocrite, I went to a counselor, doctor, pastor. I was blessed to run into a group of guys just like you. We just met through happenstance. I, I call it uh, God working anonymously. People define that as coincidence. Uh, run into these people at conferences, and we start texting. Next thing you know, we got a private app group where we've been chatting for eight years now. Uh, I flew to one of this guy's 40th birthday party in New Jersey. That's how much these guys mean to me. You know, I, I, they're, I'm closer to them than I are somebody down the street. But that's where I got my start. And she pointed out to me, she's like, you say firefighters are hurting. And you're writing in, I had journals, stacks of journals. I'd write in them. And she said, you're writing in that stuff. Nobody's reading them. What are you doing about it? Basically, you know there's a problem. You're defining there's a problem. But what are you doing to fix the problem? So I just started writing and it was basically sermons to myself about, you know, I don't understand this or I'm struggling with this. And I would write like, here's the problem. Here's a scripture and here's a firefighter application. And then I started doing research on behavioral health stuff because I was struggling with it. And then I got involved in peer support through fellowship of Christian firefighters and critical incident stress management. And then lo and behold, I get, voluntold to write the behavioral health program for our fire department. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I is not qualified for that. 
And I did a May Day. I called Dina Ali, uh, Dan DeGrice, all these different people. And they like flooded my inbox with resources. And we, I mean, our, our department's still not where it needs to be, but we have a team. Uh, we do CISN. We do individual peer support. We have two different free counseling services. We have a behavioral health clinician that the department just hired. We have financial resources. And we got a lot of work to do. But for me... What I've learned, Jake, is you said it best. We didn't get in this job to be millionaires, right? But if you teach, you make sideline money. And up to you, whatever you do with it, that's on whoever and however. But I've never relied on that to pay my bills. So that was part one with Andy Starnes. The guy's absolutely amazing. Stand by for part... Nope, that's not it. So that was part one with Andy Starnes. This guy is absolutely amazing. Now, part two will be next Monday. Be sure to listen to it. And also, please like and subscribe. Today's podcast was sponsored by Fire Facilities, designers and manufacturers of realistic, built-to-last training structures and mobile units for 30 years. Make training count. Visit firefacilities.com for more information.